Hello, this is Irv Shapiro with Make With Tech. Now, if you were looking for Dr. Vax, I'm still the same guy producing the same material, just with a new channel name, a new brand to better serve the audience of folks looking to learn how to use technology, specifically home-based desktop technology to make things. Today, we're going to cover what may be the most cost-effective, important upgrade you can make to any 3D printer. You can get started for $35 by purchasing a Raspberry Pi single board computer and running a piece of software called Octoprint. Now, many of you have heard of Octoprint before. We're going to update you with some changes that have occurred in 2021. Specifically, changes about supporting Python 3, new Raspberry Pis, specifically the Raspberry Pi 4, new plugins that are available, and how to use the Octoprint environment to do things that'll just make your print quality and experience better, including how to use Octoprint to improve the leveling of your print bed. So make sure, even if you know about Octoprint already, you watch to the very end because there are gonna be some interesting new things. Stay tuned and let's learn something together. Now, before I get started, I wanna remind you that I publish videos anywhere from two to six times a month. And so if you wanna make sure you hear about my new videos, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. Of course, any of my videos are completely free and you can feel free to publish links to them anywhere you'd like. Now let's talk about Octoprint. And we're going to begin by describing what it is. You have a 3D printer. It's noisy. Maybe you're a little bit concerned about the fumes from the melted plastic. But you have to take and connect it to a computer. Or today, you have to take an SD card and walk it over to the printer. You want to be able to put it in a back room somewhere and still be able to send prints to it. That's what Octoprint does for you as the first thing. And it's only the beginning of a long list of capabilities it adds to your 3D printer. So with Octoprint running on a computer, you can access that computer from any internet browser and use that browser-based environment, the Octoprint environment, to download or upload, I guess it's a matter of perspective, files, G-code files, to your 3D printer. Then you can monitor those prints. You can start them, you can stop them, you can pause them, you can continue them. But that's only the beginning. With a series of Octoprint plugins, those are optional additions written by other people, you can do even more. And we're gonna learn about a bunch of those today together. Gina Hoske, and Gina, I apologize in advance for my poor American pronunciation of your last name, uploaded the first version of Octoprint to GitHub about nine years ago. Since then, there have been over 7,000 commits, that's changes or upgrades to the code, across 111 releases, and 192 people have participated in the process, with Gina still writing the majority of the code. A big change that made it easier for everyone to use Octoprint was when Guy Schaefer, in August of 2013, produced something called Octopi. Octopi is a package, a distribution of Octoprint specifically designed to run on a Raspberry Pi. That made it easy for anyone to buy a $35 computer, maybe with a $10 power supply, and connect it 
directly to the 3D printer. Now I'd recommend you put it in a nice little case and I'll show you some options for that. And then you can take your 3D printer and your Raspberry Pi and put it anywhere you want and access it from a web browser that's on the same network. Now we'll see with some exciting plugins, you can further extend that to accessing it from a web browser anywhere, even outside your home or office. Now let's look at how this fits together. So if we look at this slide, you'll see that on the right, you have a 3D printer. It's connected to a computer and that computer has to be capable of running a current build of Python. The current version of Octoprint does fully support Python 3. That means it'll run on Windows, on Linux, and the Raspberry Pi is running a variant of Linux. On Mac OS or other specific operating systems that support Python. You connect to it over a internet connection over and it can be ethernet or Wi-Fi, and right out of the box it supports connecting to it on your local network. Then you just point a web browser at it and we're going to actually walk through the steps of doing this together. Now let's look at how it's used on a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has a number of USB connectors. On the Raspberry Pi 4, it has two USB 3 and two USB 2 connectors. It has an Ethernet connector. It has Wi-Fi built in, and that's the capability that I use. It does have the ability to add a speaker, to add HDMI monitors, and it has a USB-C connector, which is used for power. Now, I'm not going to connect a keyboard or a mouse or a monitor to this Raspberry Pi because Octoprint running on a Raspberry Pi provides an environment you access from a browser. Now, I'm a fan of Kanakit because they package together everything you need. Um, it's always worked. I've never gotten a bad one. If we look here at their website, you'll see you can build, buy anything from just a basic board to a basic kit, which includes a power supply, to a starter kit, which includes a power supply and an SD card, to a complete kit that includes a keyboard and a mouse, so you could use it as a multi-purpose, a general purpose computer. I generally purchase the starter kits, which includes a Raspberry Pi. It also includes um, an instruction manual, an HDMI cable. Now the HDMI cable for the Raspberry Pi is a micro HDMI to full size HDMI. It includes a case and it's probably a good idea to keep your Raspberry Pi in a case. So we have here a case. It includes a power supply and I'm a big fan of purchasing power supplies specifically made for the Raspberry Pi. More met Raspberry Pi failures where they don't seem to work right or because the power supply isn't good enough quality. It includes some heat sinks and those are components you stick on these three large chips that will draw heat away from the machine. It includes a fan for the case and it even includes an SD card. So if you buy the kit here, this one's listed as $89 with a 32 gigabyte SD card and two gigabytes of RAM, that kit would be more than adequate for use um, in building your Raspberry Pi environment. Now, what are you gonna need next? Well, you have to put some software onto your Raspberry Pi. And the way we're going to do that is by using a remarkable new program from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. That program is called the Raspberry Pi OS Imager. And so you need to go to this page. It's www.raspberrypi.org slash software and download the Imager. And then you just take the SD card from your kit. So I'm going to take this SD card right here. And you plug that SD card 
into your computer. So I have an adapter here on my Mac. I'm going to plug my SD card in. And you'll see it comes up here as Canakit. Now, this SD card, the SD cards you get from Canakit, I believe already have a Raspberry Pi operating system on them. But we don't need that. We're going to overwrite that. So I'm going to go and run the Raspberry Pi imager. Let me make this a little bigger so you can see it here. And I'm gonna choose my operating system and I'm going to go to the other specific purpose operating system. And you'll see here an entry for Raspberry Pi. I'm gonna click on Raspberry Pi and it doesn't matter which one you select here. Um, there are mirrors one or the other. So if one isn't available, you can select the other one. And I'm gonna click on Raspberry Pi. Now I need a special magic key sequence. I'm going to hit Shift, Control, X, and it asks if I want to pre-fill the Wi-Fi password from the system keychain. Um, I'm going to say no. And then I can set up a bunch of specific options for my Raspberry Pi. Now I'm going to show you in a moment how to set up some of these options afterwards. But the one we absolutely need to set up is enable SSH. And I want to have a password for SSH. And configure Wi-Fi. And I'm going to set up for the Wi-Fi network I'm already on. And I'm going to enter in the password and I'm gonna select my country. Now, why do you need to select a country? Well, by law, certain frequencies of Wi-Fi are supported in different countries. This will make sure your Raspberry Pi only uses the supported frequency for your country. And as long as I'm here, I'm gonna set that I'm in the Chicago area of the United States, and I'm gonna click Save. Now I'm going to choose my SD card. Now, depending on your computer, you might actually see on a Windows machine, you actually see all of your disk drives. Don't choose the wrong one. You'll wipe out a disk drive. You need to choose the one you're using. And an easy way to do that is to unplug or pull out your SD card, go to this window, then plug your SD card back in, go to the window a second time and see what shows up. So I know this is my 32 gigabyte card and I'm gonna select write. Yes, I wanna continue. And depending on the operating system, it will ask for a password. And now it's creating that SD card. While that SD card is writing, I'm going to add my heat sinks. So I'm just going to pull off the double stick tape on the back here. And these just stick right onto the top of the chips. There's nothing magical about that. Okay, now that I have the heat sinks on and my SD card is all done, I'm going to exit from the imager program. And it's already ejected my SD card so I can pull it out of the computer. I'm going to put it into the Raspberry Pi and I always forget where that is. It's right over here. And it goes with the label facing down. So it feels like it's upside down if you put it in this way. Then I'm going to plug in the power supply. Now the can of kits include a really nice little on off switch that you can add onto the end of your power supply cable. So I'm going to plug that in. And there's only one place it fits and it doesn't matter up or down. And you'll see the red light go on and the green line blink and the blinking of the green light indicates it's connecting to Wi-Fi. Now, there are two ways I could proceed from here. Because I've already set up the Wi-Fi and the country, I can go right to the web browser and just continue from there. If I hadn't done that, I would have to edit a file on that SD card to configure my Wi-Fi. But in addition to configuring the Wi-Fi, there are other things you can configure on your Raspberry Pi. Let me show you that very briefly. So I'm gonna go into a terminal window 
And this pretty much works the same on a Mac or a PC if you're running Windows 10 or later. I'm going to type in SSH PI at PI is the username I'm going to log in on this Raspberry Pi, and SSH is a secure terminal. Secure shell is the formal name, but a secure terminal environment I can connect to that. And I'm going to connect to octopi.local. That says, look for a computer with the name octopi on my local network, and hit enter. It's going to ask if I want to accept connecting to this. I'm going to say yes. And then I have to type in my password. That's the password I entered when I did the control shift X in the Raspberry Pi imager. And now you'll see we are connected from my desktop computer to this Raspberry Pi. Now I'm going to execute an administrator mode command that we can use to further configure our Raspberry Pi. In our specific case, we wouldn't have to do this because we did it with the Control Shift X command in the Raspberry Pi imager. However, I'm going to do this to complete your knowledge of this environment. Now, the administrator mode on a Linux computer is called super user mode. So I'm going to type in su do super user do and Raspberry Pi hyphen config, and with this we'll run a program that's on our Raspberry Pi. And you'll see there's a variety of things we can do here. The most common is system options, and this is where we could change our Wi-Fi configuration, we could change our password, or we could change our post host name. Now, if you're going to use Octoprint on more than one Raspberry Pi in your network, they can't all be called Octopi. They each need to have a different name. When you change the host name here, you're changing the name on the network of your Raspberry Pi. And in the future, you would do an SSH to that new name. We're not going to actually do anything here since we're configured the way we want already. So we'll just exit out of this and then exit out of SSH. Now, the next way we can connect over the network to this Raspberry Pi is with a browser. Let's do that now. I'm going to open a new window. I happen to be a fan of Microsoft Edge. Now, I'm a big Mac guy. So, for me to be using a Microsoft product, it has to be pretty special. There are two Microsoft products I use a lot. I use Microsoft Edge on all my computers, on my iPhone, on my Macs, and on my Windows computers. And there's one window computer I use, and that's a Surface Go, which I think is the best portable little computer the size of a tablet. But enough about that. Let's go and connect to HTTP colon slash slash octopi.local. Now, once again, if I change the host name, the name here would be different. I haven't. And since this is the first time I'm running, I'm accessing this Raspberry Pi running Octoprint, it's going to take me into a setup wizard. Let's go through these steps together. Next. Restore from backup, no. Do I want to add a username and password to Octoprint? I do. I'm going to make it Irv Shapiro and enter a password and click on create account. Now I can go to next. I'm going to allow Gina to see the use of Octoprint so she has some sense of what's going on. So we enable this here by clicking there before we say next. I'm going to leave the connectivity check enabled. I'm going to only install plugins that are not on the blacklist. I'm going to give it a name, meet with tech, and we'll call this O2. And now I'm going to click on finish. And now 
we have Octoprint running on here. All we need to do now is take a USB cable and connect this to our printer, turn our printer on and connect, and I'll show you that in a minute, and optionally, we can take a webcam, plug it into this port here, and I can show you that right here just to give you an idea. You'll see we have a camera on here, which I can point at my 3D printer, which will be over here in a moment. And so I can watch this as it's printing. Okay. Now that we've shown you how to set this all up, let me go ahead and connect to a different Octoprint instance. This is one that's connected already to my Ender 3 version 2, and I'll demonstrate some of the more interesting capabilities. Now, because this Octoprint instance running on a Raspberry Pi as a camera, I can click on the control tab up here and I can see my actual printer. Next, I'm going to click on connect. When I click on connect, it will connect to my printer over the USB cable. If it doesn't work, in all likelihood, you have a bad USB cable. USB cables, some of them are designed just to provide power and not data. So you have to make sure you have a data capable USB connection. So you'll see here, this is showing me the temperature of my printer. It's currently off. My camera. If I had loaded a model, it would show me it here. A terminal session with my camera, and you'll see here, it's displaying temperature reports coming from my camera. Potentially, there's the ability to do standard time-lapse photography with Octoprint with no add-ins. And what this will do is it'll take a picture every X amount of time. Now you'll actually see the print head moving around and everything else. There is an alternative, an add-in called Octolapse. I'm going to show you in a moment that does something sort of magical, but has a downside. So how do you go about printing with Octoprint? Well, one way is you can drag a file, a G-code file. So I'm going to drag this file to Octoprint. It'll say upload locally. I'm going to release it. And that file will now be listed right down here. And then I can click on the button that says print. And it will start printing. But if you use most of the modern slicers, they have plugins to directly integrate with Octoprint. So if I'm using Cura as an example, let's take a look at Cura here. I can go to the Cura Marketplace right over here. And I can look down here for the plugin for Octoprint. And you'll see Octoprint Connection. I click on that to install it into Cura. Now, once the plugin's installed, when I go to a printer by clicking on the printer names here and say Manage Printers, you'll see an option called Connect to Octoprint. So I'm gonna have my printer selected, say Connect to Octoprint, and it will look for the different instances of Octoprint that it finds on my network. Now, if it can't find it for some reason, and sometimes it doesn't, because if I've given it a proprietary name, it won't find it. It'll only find the Octopi names. I have to give it the name and the IP address. So how do I get the IP address? Well, if I've added the IP on Connect plugin, I can scroll down here to notifications and I'll see the name and the address. So this is 10.0.1.66. So I'm going to go back to Cura 10.0.1.66 and click on OK. And now I can click back on that and I can request an API key. So the first step was configuring it. Now I have to ask Octoprint for permission to talk to it. So I'm gonna click on request and it's gonna require that I log in to verify that I have permission. 
And you'll see here I have a pop-up window that says allow or deny. I'm going to say allow. You see now that I can connect to that instance. So I say connect. Now that I've installed the Cura plugin and I requested the APIP, I click connect. I'm ready to print something. So let's see how we do that. Well, it's the same way you would normally slice a model from Cura. Uh, let's uh, slice this puck used for a knock hockey set with a Cubs logo. So I'm going to click on slice. And you'll see here there's an option now to either save to disk or print with Octoprint. I'm going to select print with Octoprint. It's going to show me my printer. Why? Because there's a camera, there's a webcam on my Raspberry Pi. So now if I go to my Octoprint instance from my browser, I'll see the same picture that I saw inside Cura. It's the same picture here. And you'll see the temperature is starting to go up because it's currently setting up to print this puck. It says that the print time will be about an hour and it's now heating up the printer. Okay, we see here that we're getting very close to the temperature that's set in the G-code. And once we reach that temperature and it stabilizes, we'll be able to see our printer begin to print. Now, this G-code has is all set up to level the bed first with the ABL system. So we'll see that occur. Okay, now it's printing the purge line and in a moment it's going to start with our actual print. Now one thing you will notice a difference between the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 is with the 4 the video does seem to be a bit smoother. Now it's printing our brim and if we go to the G-code viewer and we can say zoom in on model, we can actually watch it. And if you've installed the plugin for Octoprint Everywhere, this plugin right down here, let's show you which one that is. Octoprint Everywhere. And if that's installed, you'd be able to monitor this from your phone or from a remote computer located anywhere. So you could go back and watch it. You could look at the G-code. You can see that the temperature is staying stable. Now, down here on the left, you'll see that my printer is at an IP address of 10.0.1.66. I know that because I loaded a plugin to show me that. What are plugins? If you go to this little wrench up here in the corner and click on it, you'll see listed down here all of the plugins that you have loaded. And I've loaded some rather interesting ones. One is called the Bed Visualizer. We'll go to that in a minute. Display Layer Progress will show me how far along in my print, my print is, as it's printing. Firmware check is built into Octoprint. It's provided by Gina. Octoprint Everywhere. That's a plugin I loaded so I can access Octoprint from outside of my local network. It is, is in essence a form of a virtual private network that allows you to connect to Octoprint from anywhere. The way it does that is when Octoprint loads, this program reaches out to another server. So the other server doesn't have a way to come into your network. This program reaches out to the other server, which is much more secure. So if I go to Octoprint Everywhere and I log into my account, and I'm gonna log in to Dr. Vax, We'll see here that I've connected my Raspberry Pi through the plugin to Octoprint. So I can go to this website anywhere. And when I say connect, I'll get the standard login prompt. 
and I'll see the same thing I would see on my local network. So these are basically two connections to my Raspberry Pi. Next, I've loaded Octolapse. I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. Printer dialogs and printer notifications are standard. Virtual printer is standard. And here's the other thing that I've loaded in here that I find very useful is IP on Connect. Now, how do you load a plugin? How do you find the plugins you want? Well, if you go up here to Plugin Manager, you'll see all the plugins you have loaded in. And you can delete any of the plugins or disable them via this screen. But you can also click on Get More. And here you can search for a variety of additional plugins. Now let me show you one more that's quite interesting that I already have installed here. Bed Visualizer. If we go here to Bed Visualizer, let me close out of the settings, and if we go and click on the hamburger menu over here, we'll see the, the additional, some additional plugins I've installed. One is Bed Visualizer. This will show you a graph of your print bed. Areas that are high will be shown as red. Areas that are low will be shown as blue. In an auto bed leveling system, when you have a bed, a sensor measures the distance to the bed at a variety of points. And it creates a matrix, a grid of those numbers. So the bed visualizer uses that grid of points to produce a graph. That's what you're seeing here. So because my graph is basically all green, my bed is pretty darn level. So what I do is I run this command, I do an update mesh to see my graph. Then I will adjust the knobs under my bed and run it again until I get a pretty much solid green image here. Now when doing that, you have to get your orientation right. This is zero, zero. So the zero, zero on my ender is this corner over here. It's the front left corner. The front right corner is actually this back corner here. So if this point here was coming up red, that means it's too high, I would tighten that screw to pull the bed down. If it's coming up blue, which means it's too low, I would loosen it up in order to raise it up. So this is the goal you're looking for. Now let me talk about one more interesting, interesting plugin called Octolapse. And the best way to understand that is to actually look at the results. So you'll see in this video that the print looks like it's just building from the bottom up and the print head's always in the same place. If I do a traditional time-lapse video, you'll see the print head moving around. This is done with Optilapse. Now what Optilapse does is at each layer change or each trigger, a trigger is a complex algorithm they use to determine when to freeze the head. They actually move the print head to a known position. Then they take a picture. Now there's a negative to that. In the earlier versions of Optilapse that sometimes did it based on time, every time you moved your print head, your print layer, your actual plastic would start to cool down. It would take the print head and then move it back. That would potentially cause a lot of additional stringing and a lack of layer adhesion between the layers. So I stopped using Octolapse a couple years ago. For this video, I tried the latest version, and I'll tell you, it looks like it works quite well. They fine-tuned the moving of the printhead in such a way that it seems to not impact the quality of the print. So I'm using it a lot more now than I did before. And these Octolapse prints are beautiful to watch. Well, folks, I hope you learned a lot. I hope you learned that Octoprint is more than just sending prints over Wi-Fi to your 3D printer. It's monitoring, it's bed visualization that helps you get the bed perfectly level. 
It's time lapse using regular snapshots or using Optilapse to get those magical time lapses. It's the ability to remotely monitor from every, anywhere if you add one of the added plugins like Octoprint everywhere. So it adds a lot of capabilities to your printer. Thanks so much for watching this Make With Tech video. And if you want to discuss this, go to forum.makewithtech.com and you can leave notes there. You can post images there. It's a free discussion forum for members of the Make With Tech community. You obviously can leave comments, click on the bell so you're notified about new videos, and let's continue to learn things together.